Live. Uh, I was muted. So I'll try that again, Jocelyn. I was saying good morning. Welcome to Solidarity Live. Uh, it's been a while, hence why I uh, left my microphone on mute. Although I think I do that all the time anyways. Um, it's 2022, although to be honest, 2022 has gotten off to a real 2021 start. You know, it's got a big 2021 energy to it that I wish it didn't. Uh, but I'm really excited for the show today, Jocelyn. Uh, how about you? Oh, I'm ecstatic. Completely ecstatic. We're actually here with David Sirota, founder, editor of The Daily Poster, and producer, genius, writer, inspirer of the most watched show on Netflix right now, Don't Look Up, or movie, I guess. But hi, David. Good morning. Hey there. Good morning. Thanks for having me. First of all, if you can't tell, I'm a huge fan. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I don't really even know where to start. We've been getting questions from people on the internet who they they range very widely from the very profound to the why were the snacks charged? For. <laughs> so, That's the most uh, profound question in the movie. Uh, there's a there's a lot of Easter eggs in the movie. A lot of so Easter my eggs. theory is it was a power move. Is that correct? Uh, you know, I, I don't like to interpret the movie for others. Um, I sort of think, you know, um, uh, art is, suppo is supposed to make people think. But I, I do think that the humor in that, at least I put it this way, my own, the, the reason I think it's funny and other people can think it's funny for different reasons is because one, I think it exemplifies kind of the interpersonal pettiness that can exist even at the highest reaches of power. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, pettiness at the point to the point where there's not even really a reason to be petty. There's no, there's no actual larger goal other than to just kind of be an asshole. Uh, and, and so I, you know, having been in situations, not exactly like that, but having been in and around politics long enough to know that that kind of little petty nonsense goes on, I thought it was particularly, um, hilarious uh, and and i i also saw somebody which i i don't think i had thought of but but somebody said you know it was really funny that it was uh somebody in the pentagon a a, a place that's notable for um for uh kind of profligate waste uh and and kind yes. of abuse uh and if you look at this movie as a a satire with different archetypes the fact that it was the general who did this i think is is pretty hilarious and also that she my favorite part of that bit um, is that she can't get over it. Right, yeah. Right, totally. even in the, in yes. with all the rest of everything, when it comes back to her, she's like, but why? <laughs> yep. And to just say, it really felt like, I'm like, oh, I can recognize that from DC a lot, where yep. like something's going on and from outside people are like, oh, there must be some deep yep. ideological reasons for like this thing. And you're like, no, that dude's just pissed that he didn't speak before right. the other guy. Uh, and now, uh, and, and that- here's a, here's a truism. Yeah. People ultimately are all just people. Yep. And I think she has trouble believing a general would behave like that because I think uh, Kate, the character, is the eyes for the audience, the a sort mm -hmm. of quote unquote regular person. And she, it, she can't believe- that a person essentially at that level of power is just behaving like 
just a, 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 a regular run of the mill jerk. And you know what? You realize you've been in politics and media, wherever, that ultimately people are just people. Well, and so that's my, I mean, I was so just, you know, I, Alex knows I'm a big fan of novels and great fiction. And the, the movie felt like a great novel to me. It was just so artistic in the way it approached this thing that we're all sort of saturated in the climate crisis. So what was your process like for writing this and coming up with it? Was sure. It, I, I mean, know? the process was basically, look, I, I, I've known Adam McKay for many, many years, um, going back to his Anchorman days. Uh, and um, by the way, he, he, he got in touch with me originally, if I remember correctly. Um, I had written something about something fairly esoteric uh, about NAFTA. Uh, and he, got in, he had read it and he got in touch with me. And I remember being like, who's Adam McKay? And you know, I looked up his, re- his oh, he's the Saturday Night Live guy. I was like, why is, why is the Saturday Night Live guy? that interested, interested in like NAFTA, like, I'm, I mean, I'm glad he was, but it was like, kind of, that's not typically who reaches out on a piece about NAFTA. And so the point in telling that story is that he has deeply seated politics, right? I mean, he follows this stuff uh, at, at the level that we do that, that really people who really care follow politics, politics to him, political engagement is not a hobby. Uh, And so, Many, many years later, we were, it was after he did the movie Vice, we were talking about, I said to him, listen, you, you have to use your superpowers for uh, something about the climate crisis. And he basically said, I know I do. I just haven't been able to figure out what, I don't want to do kind of a post-apocalyptic Mad Max uh, 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 thing. Uh, and I don't know how to, I'm not sure how to, how to go about this. And, you know, we, we talk often. And at one point I had said, you know, it really, we were lamenting the media coverage and, and how little the political leaders seem to care about climate change. I said, you know, it really does feel like an asteroid's headed towards Earth and, and nobody cares. And he said, you know, maybe, maybe that's, maybe there's a nugget of an idea there. And so we started kind of going back and forth on different scenes you could put in there and, you know, how, how the president would react and, you know, um, uh, uh, who would try to profit off of it. Uh, and how the political and media establishment would react to these revelations. And he then went to work after we kind of came up with this idea that, you know, scientists, it would be about scientists trying to navigate the modern political and media world. He went to work with all this mess of ideas that that we were going back and forth on. And he put together an amazing script. Uh, And, you know, we, we, I, gave him notes. Uh, you know, he went, it was, you know, a couple, a bunch of drafts uh, that I was giving him notes on and getting notes from others. Uh, and ultimately out came the script. And I think the script w- is fantastic. Uh, and, and then him as director, getting some of those characters to uh, improv and riff off the script, I think was even more incredible. Unfortunately, I wasn't on set even though they asked me to, you know, they said, you're welcome to come out on set. We'd love, love you to be here. But the problem was they filmed it in the middle of winter uh, in 20, uh, 2020 over into 2021, uh, pre-vaccine, uh, when COVID was the worst. Uh, and they basically said, you have to come out, but you have to essentially quarantine for two weeks. And uh, so my wife was like, listen, uh, the kids are at home. Uh, I'm in the legislature. Uh, our dog was uh, on his last and he was about to pass. Uh, and it was like, there's no way. And, and it's not safe, uh, you know, or, or if it is safe, it's like it's, it's really kind of dicey. It was, it was like, yeah, there's no way you're going out uh, to, to that. So I missed it. But the point is, all that's a long story to say, is that based on top of the script, there was incredible improvising. Uh, from uh, some of the amazing actors that you see in there. I mean, Jonah Hill uh, just just coming up with riff after riff after riff. I mean, that that stuff is just gold in this. He, he, I mean, gold. <laughs> gold. Uh, gold, because satire, you know, it, it's, it's protected speech for a reason. Like, it's actually not just a movie that you made. It's very important that it's satire. Right. Um, and satire is incredibly uncomfortable. Um, yep. It should be uncomfortable. It should make everyone uncomfortable. It just kind of like, uh, that's what it feels like, right? Um, oh, right there. But then- I mean, there's a, it's interesting. There's really not a ton of satire, movie satire uh, in America. 
Mm -hmm. um, as much anymore. I mean, I'm not that deep into the pop culture in, in America, but, but just to my, my mind, I, I don't, you know, I mean, there's the, there's the Ianucci masterpieces V right. uh, in the loop, which is probably in, in, in my view in the loop is the greatest representation of Washington. That's maybe ever been. Put and the thick of it is the best political oh. satire, right? I mean, like unbelievable. The, you're the don't look up is not derivative of anything. Like the thing no. that I was going to give a shout out to satire. It's a little like highfalutin, but it's, it's not derivative. It's when it's done well, you're actually grasping something that's like literally as old as writing, as storytelling. Yes. It's lifting up power and being yes. like, do you see how ridiculous this yes. is? And it's yes. a deeply uncomfortable thing for people. But you're like, oh, but here, laugh. And you're like, oh, thank God, right. because that's otherwise right. it was going to be too much. And that, David, is, I think, I mean, like, the balance to to pull that off just sheer brilliance and the ensemble cast of like genius uh, Thank you. obviously I, uh, what i'm proud of, what i'm really proud about the movie among other things i mean there's two things i'm proud about one, one the execution i'm proud of all of it but but one the execution and two uh the effect I, I i'm proud of the execution in the sense that um i don't think in my view that we let we took the easy road or let anybody off uh i don't want to give away Spoilers, but I think when you watch this, uh, we had that discussion. I think we have to just talk about spoilers. Sure. So okay. Fine. Spoiler alerted sure. In the so, so I don't think we let anybody off in the sense of this movie does not villainize and say regular people are stupid. It it says regular workaday people, non elites, uh, are actually quite smart. Uh, get it? Uh, understand uh, that they're being uh, manipulated and duped. Uh, there are various scenes where that is that is shown, uh, where you know the uh, folks in the in the restaurant say, "Listen, we feel like we're being we're being lied to. Tell us the truth." Uh, there's a scene uh, at the at the presidential rally where one of the people in the rally looks up and says, "You know, I think you've been lying to us." Uh, the the scientists are are, are non elites, the people who are trying to blow the whistle, and and, and so the execution is aimed. Uh, at institutions and elites. And it doesn't let those institutions and elites off. Uh, it raises questions about uh, political power. Uh, it raises questions about donor power, about uh, technological triumphalism. And of course, the comet ends up hitting the, hitting, hitting the planet. <laughs> and it doesn't let the audience off and tie it up into a nice bow and say, hey, you know, everything's going to be fine. Uh, if we all just sit back. And that, I, to me, I think that was a relatively uh, risky choice. Uh, because it doesn't let the audience off. And and just to, you know, say, I I particularly, my own personal taste, I like when cultural products don't let the audience off. I mean, I was one of the, uh, you know, as an example, I was a huge fan of the way The Sopranos ended. Like mm -hmm. some people were like, oh my God, I didn't like it. It went to black. I thought my TV broke. I was like, that is so great. It's so great that you didn't let me off. Like I have to sit there and think about it. And what was it? And I mean, that to me, that that's what I liked. And, and so it, not to give away too, too much about the, the process, but there, there at, at times there were some questions. Oh, should we, should we really, are we really going to have the asteroid hit the earth? And I was very much in the look, do you got it? Gotta, you got to go for it. I mean, you can't let the audience off the hook. And to his credit, you know, Adam, was in that camp and i think i think there was just a little bit of concern like can can the is that going to be too jarring and and i think it, it really worked now the second thing i'm really proud of uh, is the fact that the movie i think i don't think this is just i would you know i would like to believe i think it actually has done this i think it it has emboldened and boosted and made uh climate scientists activists not and, and climate scientists climate activists not just climate folks it has made i hope Lots of people who want a change, who work for change, feel seen, uh, feel recognized, feel like they're not alone. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that this movie, I think it's gotten such a, a, a huge reaction, is that it, hit, it, it confirms a lot of the things that we all know, but aren't things that aren't very much talked about and that elites and institutions don't want us to talk about. And so the relief, the, the, the response has been kind of a release, like a, see, I'm not alone. Other people see 
what the, the, the absurdity and are outraged by the absurdity of what we what I see I know is going on, but that the elites and the sort of corporatized commodified information system doesn't want us to talk about. And so I think I think to see that, to see climate scientists and movement activists uh, say that uh, and use the movie for um, to for the movements to save our world. I mean, that I that's it. Like like we, in, in a sense. That's the whole point. Like the, the rest is just icing on the cake. That's that's what it's supposed to do. Well, and it felt so <laughs> I've been writing about this a lot this week. It just it I again, I just really want to thank you. It felt so cathartic for me. And I think a lot of people my age, when I first started reading about climate crisis, I was in middle school yeah. and watching that movie really mirrored the emotions. I think a lot of young people, young activists have, you know, a Vaz published a peer reviewed study in The Lancet about the fact that like 18 to 25 year olds are having significant mental health disturbances yeah. because they're imbibing this information and they look at their governing body and they see in action, they see what should be an absurd, ridiculous SNL skit, but is actually our governing body. And when I look at this movie, it's like, it's just such a beautiful example to me of how activism and art can create something that really is empowering for people. And again, I just want to thank you because you're right. Like it, this isn't something that's like taking a shot at, you know, the caricature of the middle American Trump supporter no. that the mainstream media loves to trot out, which I think is largely a fiction, but whatever. And it, instead it's something that just the conversations around it have been incredibly empowering for people who are doing the good work. Uh, what, you know, for you, like you are uh, an incredible journalist, incredible, been politically involved in a lot of different ways. What would your dream for the activism from this movie be? Look, I, I you know, I mean, in terms of specific policies, I mean, I, I made this point before um, to Eric Holthouse, the great um, climate writer, um, that, 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 look, first of all, it's an allegory. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 a it's a metaphor. I, I've seen some of the commentary around the movie. Oh, you know, the metaphor isn't perfect. And, you know, oh, you know, the comet isn't the perfect uh, metaphor for climate. Yeah. I mean, that's to me, to, <laughs> in my view, uh, th that's kind of like saying the David and Goliath uh, um, allegory uh, is not a perfect metaphor for for the specific details of hand to hand combat. I mean, like that, it doesn't it, it, like fine. You're right. A, 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 a comet is not actually climate change. Great point. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can see that. Very right? insightful. <laughs> but, yeah, great. Uh, um, but I also said to, to Eric, um, we're not prescribing specific policy. I mean, I know the climate policies. I can give you my list of things that I, I want to see happen on climate change. But, the, but just vis-a-vis -vis the movie, the movie, I think, has a respect for the idea that first and foremost, we have to break through denial. Hmm. That, that that's the first stage of the problem. And that movements, small d democratic movements, the movements themselves have to choose the tactics and the policy prescriptions uh, to succeed. It's not for, at least it's not for this movie to say, hey, we need X, Y, Z, you know, A, B, C. It's it, the, the a movies or this movie's I think role is to try to wake up uh, as much as possible uh, the broadest number, largest number of people possible to the idea that hey, we gotta, we really gotta do something. Uh, and I've heard some, um, uh, I think it was uh, McKay, talk about wh when it comes to climate that there's look, there's a, 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 a denialist set, uh, which is is probably the hardest to reach. Uh, but and then there's a climate activism set, which already gets that we have to act. And then there's a large number of, of people. Uh, I wouldn't call them in the middle, but sort of in the middle of that spectrum uh, that know that the climate change is happening, know that it's problematic, but may not sense the urgency and or the possibility of warding off the worst parts of it. So either a mix of kind of defeatism, yeah, I know it's bad, but uh, but there's nothing we can do, or yeah, I know it's bad, but look, it's you know it's fifty to hundred years in, in the future when that. So that set of people, a large set of people, I think are 
activatable. Uh, I, I, I have hope for, for that set of people uh, to feel more urgency, to feel that it's possible uh, to fix this problem, to see a movie like this and walk away from it saying, hey, listen, um, this movie is not prophecy or destiny. It's cautionary. It's, it's a ca and there's a line in the movie that actually hasn't gotten a ton of attention, which to me is one of the most important lines. It's, it's where uh, in, in uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, sort of network-esque network. rant uh, on TV, where he kind of breaks down, he says, we could have stopped it. Hmm. And, and, and to me, that is such an important line. Uh, and that actually, if you do use the metaphor, you know, take it, draw it all the way out, um, they could have stopped it when it was far away. They had the technology to do it. They, they, they could have relatively easily stopped it. And they didn't. And that's his lament. And that's actually the point when it comes to climate change. The earlier we act, the easier it is to actually mitigate the worst effects. I've seen a, I, I've heard somebody um, use a, 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 a ski mountain. Uh, as a, a, a slope, as a, a as a metaphor for this, that you know, if we had started dealing with climate change um, uh, 20 years ago, the mountain, in terms of what we had to do, you know, reduce energy this much, looked like kind of a green, like a, a green circle or 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 a blue a blue square. I'm from Colorado, I ski, right? So like a, a relatively easy hill to like you know go up. Now it's looking a little bit more like a black diamond because we've waited, and the longer we wait, the more steep that hill becomes, and so. To me, that line from DiCaprio, we could have stopped it, essentially had we acted early, is the, is one of the messages here. Like, hey, we can stop the comet. Like, that's, that's a great thing. Like, when you walk out of a movie, you're like, I'm, it's a sci-fi horror movie. You're like, thank God I don't live in that world, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think people walk out of this movie like, well, I, I think we are actually living in this world. But the, the movie, I think, postulates that we don't have to stay on that track. That does not have to be our reality if we decide to change things. And here's where I get to ask my specific question, which I know is um, it's like a, it's a vague one um, in, but because satire, it's almost always the same answer, but it's who's the villain uh, in, in this film. Uh, it's important. And I'll tell you what I think. Uh, and then you, you tell me, but I think it's super important that you said it's not people who have been conned. Right. Um, you have sympathy for people who have been conned and none for the con man, uh, none for the people in power who have led people to this way for profit. Uh, and so it's clearly it's a systems issue. But the billionaire stands out as clearly the right. Why did the ships turn around? Because some human, a, a man, uh, thinks that he's more than that. Uh, he actually calls himself Kronos at one point, right? right, right, he, right. He, but he predicts the future. He's like one of the best characters I've ever seen uh, to put into, uh, to personify who we talk about on this show all the time, the billionaires. We don't have to let the comet crash into the earth. Right. We right. all win. There's only one small group of people who lose it's these billionaires they right. will never be on the same side as us they're they think they can escape life and earth they think that they can escape death very importantly they think that they are magical and they're not they're just human which is what satire almost always the end of it all is right the emperor wears no clothes um, those in power who you really, and there's a line in the movie, um, I can't remember exactly, but where they're like, I know you want to believe that the people in power are figuring it out, but they're not. Right, that's it's right. never up to them. It's right. only up to us. And that is what I hope uh, opens up. A, that we can never, it, it, the billionaires are the villains, right? That class. Uh, they can't actually solve problems. Only we can solve problems. That's right. Uh, so and, that's and, I th and I think there's something about that that character, uh, which I think is really um, the reason why I think it 
Uh, Mark Rylance is amazing. Actor. Amazing. I mean, just truly amazing. And in that role is just unbelievable. He should win uh, everything. Just uh, my he's personal he's just so, I mean, he is just so incredible. Um, but I think part of the reason that that character resonates is because we see that authentically he does not see himself as a villain. That a lot of times in Hollywood productions, the villain is like Dr. Evil, which is why we laugh at Dr. Evil, because Dr. Evil from the, you know, from the from the uh, Austin Powers movies, Dr. Evil is self-aware of himself being evil and loves to be evil, which is hilarious. But actually, a, a lot of people we portray that we see we see as evil. They've convinced themselves of, of their of, they've created messianic narratives in their own internal monologue about themselves. Uh, and I think that uh, when Peter Isherwell, this character that Rylance plays, uh, is, is um, offended when uh, Leonardo DiCaprio says to him, you know, I want you to be treating this like, a, like, like I want you to respect the science here. Uh, I, I don't want you to be treating this project like you're a businessman. Are you calling me right. businessman? And he like, he like genuinely feels <laughs> aggrieved that the scientist sees him motivated as a businessman. Now he's the third richest human in, in the history of the world, which is, so, but, but, but I think when we think about, you know, whatever billionaire you have in your mind, a lot of them have created a messianic narrative in their own minds about themselves where they believe genuinely in the, um, the goodness of the horrible things that they're doing. Uh, and I think that then, that, and, and I think some of that bleeds out into their followership, that their, that their followership believes that they are messianic figures. Uh, and and it's, it's all a ruse. It's, it, it, and if it's not a ruse, it, it's, just, it's just wrong. That as I said at the beginning of this, people are just people, even billionaires are just people they're distorted and whatever people they're messed up and you know they're damaged and they're pathologically you know you know they're sociopaths but they're just people and so i think part of the message of the movie is there is no man behind the curtain there is no uh, savior there for us and and i think that's an unsettling thing and and frankly i it was the feeling that i had um uh, on the election night of 2016, which is that there was this idea, I think, boiling in the background of American politics that, listen, uh, uh, Donald Trump. Somebody's Trump's got it. Go. Yeah, so they got it. They're like, come on, it's not really going to happen. Like, you know, I mean, like, I mean, even the Clintons were like, yeah, Donald Trump should run because we'll like, because that could never, they never did. Right. Yes. I mean, that was the whole thing. The Clintons literally yes. said, you should look at running. I mean, that's a, that's part of our history. I know we don't, liberals don't like to talk about that, but that happened. And I think it was because like, that, come on, that can't happen. And then on election night, to me, there was that feeling. And, and look, I'm, not, I'm not, obviously not a like Hillary Clinton, you know, huge fan of Hillary Clinton, to say the least. But the point is, I felt on election night when Donald Trump was elected, you know, I knew it in, sort of intellectually, but it was a deep feeling of, 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 of not a realization, but a, a reminder that keep calm, nothing is under control. There is no, there are no, there's not one cabal of people uh, uh, in the back. I mean, there are dark forces, there are people pulling strings, but there's not one uh, set of people who got it, who just are gonna make sure we're all okay. That is, and I think that we wanna believe that that's true because it's terrifying to admit the reality that we're, I mean, not to get existential about it, but we're all on a floating around. We're pieces of dust on a piece of dust floating around in a giant universe of dust particles. Ultimately, nothing is under control. There is no one overarching set of people who just make sure we're all okay. We all have to actually participate in a day to day way and do our parts because others are not going to save us. Can I do, uh, Jocelyn, just one quick follow-up on that? Um, which is, it, it, it's everything you just said, 
we have billionaires, but it's not like this is new, right? Like look back at totalitarian autocracies, right? Like the whole of humanity, more time, if you look over history has been spent where we humans, we get a lot of comfort in offloading our purpose to others and being yes. like, I don't know why I'm here. I know I'm going to die someday, right. but like, I don't want to think about that. And That's so right. we in, in, we're like, that person is in charge. Right. And then when there's crises is when it all cracks open and everyone's like, Oh my God, Czar Nicholas is a moron. Right. <laughs> and the world is on fire. And everyone thought that there were smart people. And you're like, there's not, there's not, Cut open any institution and out comes people just right. like you and me. Uh, and the uncomfortableness, I think we should, we should own it. We should live in it and realize, as a, a pat phrase I always say, I think I stole it from Mike Papantonio, actually, uh, of just reminding ourselves the cavalry is not coming. There is no cavalry. Is we no cavalry. are the cavalry. We are the only ones who can actually not... Uh, have the asteroid hit us, not have the comet hit us and destroy us because we have to defeat uh, the billionaires who are like, well, maybe it's a good thing. But it's That's like right. the the reason that satire, when it taps in, is feels so old and powerful is because you can read Aristophanes, ancient Greek, uh, and read about the exact same stuff with the Athenian War, right? Where he was satirizing people in power. And the whole thing is always to remind people that the emperor, the billionaire, the aristocrat, the president, the whoever is a human, yep. just like you and I don't yep. give them a special thing. Elon Musk doesn't have a special knowledge that none of us have. Uh, and in fact, and then I'll bring it back to your movie. Uh, I love this thing where it's like, can you please listen to the scientists? Like right. there's a process Yes. And these are kind of the softest, sweetest people who look at this machine. Uh, and I also like feel I'm in the movie sometimes too, because I have to laugh at, I'm like, the only way to make change in this system is you do do stuff, right? Um, like, and I know I'm playing in this, this, this uh, theater that goes on. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make change uh, against the powerful uh, but then, you know, you have to find some humor in it, too, because it's hilarious, especially it the is. Ariana it Grande is. concert and, part. And I think the thing that's 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 triggered some folks is the fact that that we don't name a political party for the president. Uh, and and I think I think that's also made some some folks uncomfortable. Oh, you're saying both parties are the same or you're saying that, you know, and first of all, Again, it goes back to a, a fundamental point about art. Like we want the viewer to bring, mm -hmm. to, to, to glean from it as much as they can through their own experience, as opposed to us saying to you, you this is, you got to believe this, this, and this about your political views. I also think, but I, but I also think that clearly if you're being honest, there, there is a political class in this country that is transpartisan. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the, and I've, I've sort of said this uh, 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 as, as a kind of pushback, which is, listen, if you think President Orlean is Trump, you think President Orlean is Hillary Clinton, you think President Orlean is uh, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, whoever, we're not saying that. President Orlean is an entirely fictional character. Your decision about who you think the president is says a lot more about your perception uh, and your choice of politicians to like or not like, then it says about anything in, in the movie, which is which is fine. Um, but I think that that when we talk about um, sort of these deep civic religions, you want to believe, for instance, that there's somebody uh, who's going to take somebody else is going to take care of everything. Uh, one of the other civic religions is a a religion of I must worship my party my leader, uh, my politician, my favorite media person on television. That's who I worship. Whatever they say must be right. Whatever the other side says must be wrong. Uh, and that is an enormously problematic 
a facet of our society. And, and, be, and especially for scientists who, science is physics and math. It doesn't care about party. It doesn't care about which particular pundit on TV you like or which pop, your favorite senator. It doesn't care about any of that. And one of my um, laments in my own work as a journalist uh, uh, and just as a person in this country is that that dynamic on both sides has gotten far worse in, in my perception in my lifetime. That is to say that the um, unquestioning worship of, for instance, Donald Trump by his hardcore supporters, the unquestioning worship of the Democratic Party, of Barack Obama, of Democratic Party leaders by um, what I call team blue liberals, it, both of those are a problem. I happen to have more values agreement, even with the sort of so-called team blue liberals. I have some more on, on specific values, but the problem is, is that values on both sides don't really, they, they come secondary. Values and facts come secondary to loyalty to the dear leaders. And that is an enormous problem. That is a, and, and it's, it's got, as a journalist, I felt that in the sense of if I, I mean, if I published a story in 2016, we published a bunch of investigative stories about money tied to Hillary Clinton. I was accused of being a disloyal, horrible Trump supporter, uh, disloyal to the Democratic Party. We did a bunch of investigations on Trump. I was accused of being just a, a, a liberal Democratic water carrier. And, and what was disappointing about that is that when you do journalism, you want the facts to be judged on their merits. Like, listen, you may be a Democrat and you know, you, you, you may not, but, but like, if you're, if, if you don't like this story about money going to Hillary Clinton, be mad at Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. right? I'm just, I'm here to report the fact and, and imagine that then for climate scientists, they're here to tell us about what's going on with the, with the livable ecosystem. And they're trying to say that in a political space where facts become cannon fodder in partisan wars media wars and culture wars, rather than us being able to stipulate the facts and then the partisan media culture war being about what to do about the facts. Right? At least, at least a debate about what to do about the facts stipulates the facts are the facts. And, and so my lament, one of the things I find mo I found most frustrating uh, on both sides, and it's not to equate the values of both sides. I know where my own personal values are. It's not to say that both parties are exactly the same, but it is to say that this culture of worshiping the dear leader, of putting the politicians, the party apparatuses on a pedestal is a deeply serious problem in this country right now on I, both sides. You know, I don't even know where to start because you both are saying so many things that I find inspiring and true. And just to add, you know, David, like one thing that I think a lot about is you know, the this whole bowling alone dynamic of where community spaces have broken down so significantly due to the extremities of uh, wage stagnation and highly transit that it's hard for me to not feel that as things like personal relationships and personal friendships are on the decline, people do engage in that exacerbation of offloaded purpose. Because like, if our lives are empty, it's way more easy to make your identity about a political candidate or even celebrity worship or these fatuous sort of empty obsessions that don't look up. It's just, it's so, the reason it's so funny and that it, you know, because we're, we're just like, we're drowning in it and the digitized, like, you know, Oh, this celebrity, that celebrity, this candidate was caught sleeping with someone. And we're also distracted that again, when you're that lonely, it's easy to be less critical. Yes, and the pan and the pandemic has exacerbated it. Yes. And I would argue that that social media, I mean, not to sound like a, a like an old borscht belt uh, a comedian, but it's like unsocial media, in the sense that social media <laughs> connects you at a superficial way to people. Um, and, and I, I think actually social media does a good job of keeping people. One thing social media does a good job of is keeping you actually in touch with and close to the people you already know offline, like mm -hmm. your family, your friends, you know, sharing photos and the like. But social media vis-a-vis -vis people you've 
never met makes it easier for you to meet people. So that's good. But the, the downside is, is that it makes you, it makes it easier for you to dehumanize people as well, that it's easier to, to demonize people uh, from behind a screen. Right. I mean, think about, think about how, how our society would think about treating somebody the way think about it. Like you go on Twitter and you see people, you know, ragging on each other, dunking on each other. Like for the most part, people don't do that, you know, in, offline, like in, in there'd a, be in fights, a, there'd be fights, fights that it's like uncomfortable. It's like, Oh, I see the, okay. Like you said something stupid and, but like, I see you're just like a, you're actually not a terrible person. Like you're just, mm -hmm. you just kind of said something dumb, like, or, you know, you shot your mouth off or whatever. Right. Like, and so I think social media has exacerbated this cult phenomenon that we're talking about, yes. which is I can dehumanize the other side. Uh, anybody who disagrees with me and my tribe, my politician, my cable TV host, my party, whatever it is, that gives me an entire belief system to know who's on my side and who isn't. And of course, the problem is that the politicians, the political apparatus, uh, the media institutions, guess what? They don't want the uh, us versus them to ever be based on. They never want it to be based on economic power, uh, on political power. They want it to be based on culture, uh, on identity, on things that don't threaten the actual power of this country, uh, the actual financial and political power of this country. So well, and, do you know, one of my favorite beliefs and like core psychological beliefs is that healthy relationships and healthy countries seek equality, you know, and it's what you're saying, David, like if we have this like celebrity worship, you know, dichotomy, it's much easier to focus on facts and the asteroid coming toward us. It's more easy to talk about like who's hot, who's not. And I guess my big question is, this is actually a question that someone had when we posted about speaking with you is you are an incredibly accomplished journalist how i don't i don't want to put you on the spot in any way but how like do you have are some of the things about the media in this movie based off your own frustrations trying to be that fact based journalist in a time which more rewards punditry and clicks and celebritized you know nonsense yeah look i mean i i, I think you know my own experience as a journalist trying to um, essentially get fact into the discourse. A lot of that frustration is reflected in this movie. Same thing, but that uh, I'm not unique to that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the same thing for climate scientists. Uh, it's the, you know, it's the same. And, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think that obviously is baked into the movie. Uh, that's, that's, Frankly, that's where the original idea for the movie, because again, the the story for the movie is not just the client a, a comet is headed towards Earth. I mean, that's the oldest. I'm not. I wasn't the first person to ever, you know, to come up with that. It's the oldest story in the history of the planet, like the literal asteroid, you know, with the dinosaurs and the like. The story of the movie is how we, in an advanced society, can learn something of that gravity, and then not have systems and structures in place to first make that revelation widely known and accepted and then constructively act on those facts. And I feel like, frankly, that in my, I'm one of many people uh, who that has been uh, definitional to my own work, which is I report things that lots of uh, people in power don't want to be reported. And it, no matter at a certain level, there's a feeling that no matter how big the story is, how big the horrifying crisis we may, I, some of my reporting has revealed, it's very difficult to get it to what they call in the media world, to get it to land. I mean, the reporting that we did on Cuomo, for instance, on nursing homes and him uh, getting get, getting immunity for the uh, corporate owners of nursing homes as uh, as there was this horrible situation uh, uh, of COVID in nursing homes to get them legal immunity. Uh, we broke that uh, big pieces of that story. It took forever for that story to land. I mean, 
death after death after death over months to get that story to finally land. And it did land. Uh, it, it did land um, for not just because of us, but for various reasons. But the point is, is like, it shouldn't have been that difficult to get a story of that consequence to land. And in the middle of that story being reported, uh, he was being touted by the same media system as a national hero who was saving everybody. I mean, it was, it was, it really did feel like uh, that was my own most recent feeling of being like uh, Kate DiBiaschi or Dr. Mindy uh, in the movie where you're like, listen, like thousands of people are literally dying. The corporate owners of the nursing homes don't have a legal deterrent to try to actually do whatever they can to fix things because they know they, they don't have to fix things because there's not a threat that they're going to get sued into the ground, right? Like you've you've taken away the deterrent. And to to feel like, I mean, it's look, the story got out there. I mean, it really did. I mean, it, it got around at one level, but it's like, how how is that story out there? And then he's getting to go on CNN every night and being touted as like, you know, a, you know people, I'm a Cuomo sexual and he's like the greatest. Yeah. He's a, he, he, you know, people saying, you know, regular people will turn it on their TV and say, you know, he's really, he's really an inspiration to me through this pandemic. He's really what I need. You're like, what, what is happening here? Like, like I, I honestly felt like that. Just even talking to you about it, 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 I'm about to give my like Dr. Mindy rant, right? Like, <laughs> like if we can't agree that that's a, that what was going yeah. on there was a problem, like what have we become? Yes. That's what it's a great, I mean, that network moment uh, is really familiar uh, and a great piece of like sort of cinema. And sort of where I laugh the most is when like that feeling that you were just recreating for yourself and thinking about that. <laughs> I feel that almost every day, right? Like every day in the work that I do, all I want to be like is, what do you mean? Yes. They, they, they're killing people because uh, they they have a cartel to raise the price of insulin every fucking year. Sorry, yes. Brad. Right. Yes. And I just want to freak out at them. But then I'm like, oh, but I have to exist in this system. So instead, I'm like, I'm going to get media training and learn how to like look into the camera and smile and be like, well, you see, these sociopaths are killing people. For It's mind boggling. I know. But right. I like, know. And that, that part, that's where she what says I felt. I felt one of the seen. cores of the movie. I felt seen, David. Yes, one of the cores in the movie, I think, is when she says, I mean, it's such, a, and she's so amazing, she's a great actress, and she delivers it so perfectly, where she's like, what if the destruction of the planet isn't supposed to be fun, right? Like, what if, yes. what if it's not supposed to be, this isn't supposed to be good news, right? And then you see the, the you know, they flash to the, the essentially the, the, you know, the New York, Herald, which is like a stand in for the New York Times and sort of elite media. And they're like, oh, no, don't do that. Don't don't like don't don't be serious. Like, don't don't, don't, don't be bad too. News. No don't, one wants bad news. No one. No one and it's not. And you know, here's the thing. It's not just bad news. One of the things that I think um, has I've been trying to kind of psychoanalyze um, why this movie has has generated such a response. And I think part of what makes I think people uncomfortable is the movie clearly believes in something. It has yeah. a core soul. Uh, and I think one thing that you, you sense from, it's unspoken in our elite media and political debate. Um, there's this idea that to believe in anything too passionately is to make one unserious, hmm. to make one unrealistic, to make one too emotional, uh, to make one hysterical, right? And the thing is, is that it, seriously, like if you it, read the New York Times, read the Washington Post, read the Wall Street Journal, there's this underlying idea, unstated, that anybody who believes too passionately in anything cannot be fully taken completely seriously. They must be sort of um, eye rolled or at least patted on the head. Uh, and the thing is, is that that unto itself is an ideology. Oh, nobody who believes in anything too, too passionately should be taken too seriously. And I think that's a problem. I mean, that's and that and that I think part of what I take away from those scenes in the Daily Rip in the movie is and then be, and you're sort of the elites being like, oh, don't you know, don't Kate DiBiaschi, don't be too upset. Don't be too, you know, you, you didn't do, you, you know, when he says after the she, she says the world's going to end, you know, 
he says he says to Leo DiCaprio, he says, you know, you did great, but you know, the yelling lady didn't do didn't do so great. It's like it, it, it sort of exudes the idea that to feel passionately even about the literal end of the world is like, oh, come on, you can't like it can't really take you fully seriously, even if you're factually scientifically correct. Well, and I think, you know, I every single word you're saying, thank you, because you just hit it on the head, something I feel like I've been trying to put into words my entire life. Look, during the French Revolution, we had this shift away from spiritual institutions to rational institutions and created this, you know, hyper-rationalized humanism that was, was going to define public discourse for the next 200 years, which is obviously a very good thing. We like that we use the, you know, our prefrontal cortex a lot. We like that we're, you know, living in our heads a lot. But now we've reached this opposite extreme where instead of existing in the rational discourse, we're existing in a rationalization discourse. And the fact that like, we're not using our hearts anymore, which like, look, we're emotional people for a reason. If you hear that we're all gonna die, that's supposed to provoke an extremely emotional reaction because that's a bad thing. And, you know, it seems like in the mainstream media, there is this very snide, attitude towards anything which provokes an emotional response that's right and that's, that's right. disturbing that's right. it is disturbing and i think that listen it, uh, you know uh, look passion emotion uh it can get out of hand sure uh, i mean i think it's january 7th the day after the anniversary of the january 6th uh, uh insurrection riot whatever you want to call it I would argue that that's a situation where uh, people's emotions and passions got wildly out of control uh, and that that's not a good thing. Uh, that's a terrible thing. Uh, I have lots to say about, uh, you know, where that came from. Uh, obviously, I was horrified by it, like everybody. But um, I think we as a society, uh, at, you know, just to digress for one sec, I think we don't, We uh, the media has not asked is not really interested in, and neither are the politicians asking questions of where that comes from. Uh, it's treated as a, as a moment in time uh, that happened kind of magically out of nowhere. Uh, uh, and if, if it was out of anywhere, it was just, you know, Donald Trump was a jerk and that, that's why this happened. Nobody, very few people want to ask why, what it is, what, what is it, a, is it an anomaly or is it a piece of a larger story? Uh, and again, it's not to justify it, not to rationalize it, but just to ask, what is the context for this? But my point going back to emotion and, and feeling, I agree that emotion and feeling can get out of control. But I also think that scoffing at anybody with passion, emotion and feeling, thinking that they're that it's unserious is deeply problematic. It's frankly, it's deeply um, elitist. Uh, and it's it's really kind of inhuman because again, if we're all people, we all have those we all have you know passionate feelings. And I think it, it, if you can't feel passion and emotion and um, uh, and, and sadness and um, feelings of terror, and when you think about something like the climate crisis, um, that's a that that's a problem. And, and the media shouldn't be there to be, uh, to anesthetize us. The media shouldn't be there to make us, uh, uh, to, to say, don't look up. Uh, we need a media that says, listen, this is uncomfortable. This is scary. Uh, but we have to take this seriously. We have to take all of these crises seriously. That is the role of the media. And I, some people have asked, you know, is, is, is it a chicken or the egg game? Is the media giving us what we want or are we, or, you know, and, and is it really, can you really blame the media for that? Is it really a problem with us? And my, my view is, yes, there's an interplay between what, what we supposedly want uh, and what the media gives us. But I think it's a cop out that we know from the advertising industry, uh, from the media industry over the modern media industry that manufacturing desire is a big mm -hmm. thing in media uh, that media institutions can create uh, uh, interest uh, can create what we think uh, we as a society is important and is not important. Uh, Fox news literally does that all the time 
uh, when major events are happening and it's focused on something that, that to non-Fox viewers seems ridiculous. Uh, and it's be, but, but the viewership of Fox wants that because Fox says this is important. And so the, for me, as somebody in journalism, I, I hope one of the takeaways for the media when, they, when this is watched by people in the media is that we have a responsibility uh, to, to, to not just presume that people want garbage. We have a responsibility to take things that are uncomfortable and yet empirically, on an empirical basis, super important, like climate change, like the science, public health science. We have an obligation to not say, oh, those things don't rate. And by the way, the movie proves that, that the, the idea that climate doesn't rate. I mean, the movie is the biggest movie on the world's largest platform. That, that, that's over. Goodbye. Like <laughs> the idea that climate doesn't rate, like just good night, right? Like that's done. But I do think what it says is you have to find ways to compellingly present the story of climate change. That, and and there's, there's frankly, there's a talent question. There's an imagination question, which is how, how do you cover climate every day if you're a working reporter? How do you bake climate coverage into your, into your coverage in a compelling way? And I think it's, it's, I don't think it's that hard, right? I mean, coverage of the economy is baked into day-to-day -day coverage. Yep. Right. It, coverage of various things is baked into the day to day political coverage. You know, you go to a, today, there'll be a White House press conference. They'll be asked about the jobs report. Will they be asked about the latest carbon emissions report? Probably not. It, it, this isn't that hard. It's just a matter of, hey, we actually have to do this. And hopefully the movie shakes people into waking up that it is possible. It's just, it's kind of like a, oh, you know what? The way we've been doing things doesn't have to be the way we keep doing things. And David, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you the last word here, but first I wanna just point out that that uncomfortableness, uh, that realness, that not garbage, that telling the actual truth is actually, that's where the hope is as well. It's the opposite of hopeless. When you delve in, the propaganda is telling us that we have no power. The propaganda is telling us there's nothing we can do. So just don't look up. Uh, but the truth is that we have all of the power. Every ounce of power that exists resides in the people. And when we recognize that and work together, uh, we could even stop uh, the comet of climate change. We can build a future for all of us. Uh, and that's the deep hope. Uh, from I, I feel from us on this uh, show right now that we talk about all the time, it's a belief in the future. Yes. That's what we have and those billionaires don't because they've yes. collapsed it all onto themselves, just ego. And we believe in the future and there's a, an in, uh, a, a immense amount of hope in that. Uh, so I want to do this plug for you though, David, uh, which is <clears throat> tell everyone how they can sign up for Daily Poster, which continues to deliver hard-hitting journalism uh, day after day after day. Annoyingly, you just dropped a super important story like yesterday. And I'm like, I can't even talk about that with you because Don't Look Up just came out. Uh, so David, where can people sign up and support your uh, ongoing journalism? Well, well, thank you. Thanks for saying that. I really appreciate it. Um, people can find our, our work at dailyposter.com. We do daily day-to-day -day, uh, investigative uh, accountability journalism. Uh, you know, we, listen, I, and I want to be clear here. Uh, you're, you may not agree with every single thing that you uh, read at the Daily Poster in the sense of it, we, we go and we cover the things fearlessly, I think, uh, that are, um, people have passionate feelings of. Uh, people, uh, we'd have a story today about um, uh, vaccines, uh, and uh, testing mandates and the like. And I know people feel passionately about these things. What we try to do, and I think successfully, we ground our reporting in the facts. Uh, we also do some commentary, but most of what we do is, is reporting, grounded in facts. We, we are clear about what our principles are, but the reporting is fact-based. It is built on verifiable facts. That's why you'll see all of our stories have so many hyperlinks. So you don't have to believe us. You can go make sure you can go check to make sure that we're right. And we do that with the hope, granted some days it feels kind of ridiculous, but with the hope, as I said before, that 
our reporting is our reporting grounded in fact you may it may make some of the it may offend your political loyalties oh you're saying this about democrats i i like democrats but the hope is, is that the reporting gets judged on the merits you can like democrats you can like republicans you can hate democrats you can hate republicans my hope is that our reporting is judged on the merits of the facts presented and that more and more people um, take in journalism, take in media in a way where they accept and certainly verify, but accept verified facts. And one, don't, don't demonize the people reporting the facts, actually appreciate that the facts are being put out there. And two, if you're mad at anybody about those facts, be mad at the people creating those facts. In other words, creating the realities that you're mad about. Don't be mad uh, at the people for um, spotlighting uh, and exposing those realities. Uh, and, and just one last thing. I mean, I, I, we experienced that, for instance, with the Cuomo thing. Uh, uh, you know, Andrew Cuomo is a great Democratic leader. Oh, you know, uh, yeah, what you're exposing is it, maybe it's true, whatever. But like, you know, you're getting in the way of a guy who is leading us. And, 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 and it was, you know, not to belabor it, but it was very frustrating. And then ultimately, the facts finally win the day. But the point is, is that evaluate facts before you evaluate whether you will accept facts because they might offend the party or the politician you are loyal to. That's the hope of our work. Jocelyn, you want to sign us out? I've just loved every minute of this conversation. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, David, for everything you do and for giving me and I think everyone watching a whole lot to think about. Are we so, you know, keeping involved in your journalism? Uh, do you think you would return to Hollywood for more climate satire? Well, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of folks about what the what the next kinds of projects are. Um, you know, we did I should say we did this big podcast um, series. Uh, I, I worked with Alex Gibney uh, on this separate series um, called Meltdown, which was about how the financial crisis and the weak response to the financial crisis uh, created the political conditions for the rise of Donald Trump uh, and the uh, and the movement uh, behind him. It's a story that not a lot of people, not a lot of certainly not a lot of liberals like to talk about. Because, again, it raises uncomfortable truths about what uh, the Obama administration did uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, how it used its mandate or didn't use its mandate. Uh, so I'm looking into uh, we may do some more podcasts. We may do some more movie stuff. I mean, it's it's honestly it's been a it's been a super wild ride these last uh, <laughs> few months. Um, it's you know, just to, getting started, David. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we we will see. I mean, I, I it's it's been incredible. I it, and and again, you don't have the number one most watched movie on the largest platform in the I world. I mean, that's so way beyond my like. I, that's I was why like, I'm I, trying to just tell you. I know. I know. I, it's like it's not like, like oh, now it's over. I was I'm like, on to I the was next like, one. <laughs> I was like, listen, I was like, yeah, the movie's going to be good. It's, it'll get a, it's like be a, nice, be a good movie. It's like, I'm proud of the movie. It'll get a decent response. Now, now it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's so giant. I, it's really hard to wrap my head around how. Hold how, on. Just uh, hold on. I, I know. Exactly. Exactly. So thank and, you. Thank you and, both for your work. And thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate it. And we will continue to use it to raise it up uh, and to build that activism and that power to remind people that we have the power to build the future that we want. Absolutely. We don't have to accept what's given to us. David, no. thank you so much for joining us. On thank Solidarity you. Thanks. Live. Thanks to both of you. Thank you so much.